My article, The Centrality of Education, is actually a, an attempt to give a precy of a very fat book, uh, The Main Enterprise of the World. And um, in the issue in which it will appear, it is commented on and uh, talked about by a number of people and leads to a very interesting discussion. I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to talk about the article itself. I'm going to give a precy of it. And since it's a precy of a book, I'm giving a precy of a precy. So I will have to go quite uh, uh, quickly and the result will probably be a little bit skeletal. So the book is inspired by the thought that there are two different kinds of ways of pursuing the philosophy of education, which, like Dewey, I conceive to be a really central part of philosophy. The first takes the issues that arise urgently in the day with the framework provided in the day and attempts to sort out some of the problems that arise with respect to the, uh, the, the practice as it's normally pursued. The second stands back and asks a little bit more radically how we should think about education and how perhaps we might need to make rather large reforms in our educational system. I must say that, um, that this distinction is probably not as sharp as I've uh, made it or tried to make it seem. Uh, there are probably grades in between. Now, I react to what I regard as the economic distortion of education in our age, the idea that the economic imperative overrides everything else. The task of education, as sort of given to the young of a particular country by the state, is to enable those young people to develop into productive workers who can increase the um, output of the state, as if they were really cogs in a machine for producing greater profit. That is, of course, completely at odds with the classical, wonderful, long tradition in philosophy of education, which might actually be seen as a whole different canon leading from Plato through people like Rousseau and Kant and Mill and Du Bois to people like Tagore and Dewey in the 20th century. What I want to do then is think about some kinds of ideals that come from this tradition, which I feel are in need of renewal. And my title, The Main Enterprise of the World, comes from a line by Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, in his seminal address, The American Scholar, where he says, the main enterprise of the world for splendor, for extent, is the upbuilding of a man. I changed that to human being, but uh, um, we can excuse Emerson, I think, who was in his time something of a feminist. I think this is a very important thought. There is nothing that we do in our lives that's more central than producing and training and raising the young people who will succeed us. And I link this thought to what I think is a very important theme in Dewey, the idea that we're part of a very large human project to which each of us can, with good fortune and good training, make our own individual contribution. And so there are, I think, three ideals that uh, an account of education should try to harmonize. One, which is perhaps the good thought behind the economic imperative, is that young people should be trained to support themselves and to do things that uh, will meet their material needs. But perhaps more importantly, they should also be trained to have lives that are not only happy, but also in a certain sense, fulfilling. They're not merely pleasurable, but they also leave something behind them that people can, and those who love them can, be proud of. The other uh, ideal that I think is often sidelined in contemporary theories of education is the training of the citizen. It's not just that we want these people to live fulfilling individual lives, we want those lives to be brought into harmony with one another, to work together to some larger goal. And so the first part of my book is really an attempt to elaborate these three ideals 
to show how two of them, the ideal of citizenship and the ideal of a, leading a fulfilled life, can be brought easily together. That the fulfilled life is an other directed life, and that involves a certain kind of solidarity with those around you. I, I go on at some length about this and about the way moral development and about the way religion plays into it. And then in part two of the book, I turn to um, more sort of local issues, thinking about in part two, the kind of things that somebody who was trained to uh, try to exemplify this harmony of ideals uh, might sort of learn from what we now know. And so there I give a chapter on the reform of science education. I give a chapter emphasizing the importance of education and the arts. And I give a chapter devoted to the humanities and social sciences, which is intended to show how these can be integrated with one another to help the young person's voyage to self-understanding. And then finally, in part three, I have to face up to the incredible idealism of the whole thing. And I have to uh, face the fact that in a society like the one we have, uh, these kinds of things uh, are very difficult, actually probably impossible to bring about. And my reply to that is, of course, that certain kinds of social changes are required. Here again, I'm following Dewey. And I try to give a set of criteria for what I call a Deweyan society in which this kind of education might become possible. And then in the last chapter, I have to take on the so-called political realist, the economists who are saying it'll never work in practice. And there I try to show that in fact, the claim that you can't do this, this kind of thing and make it work you can't have the kind of society and the kind of education and the kind of people whom I imagine. Uh, it rests on sheer speculation. What I try to do in this final chapter is simply to knock the alleged props out from underneath this supposed iron truth. So that's the whole story. And if you read the article, you will see uh, how it's developed. And you will also see how uh, people in the in who comment on it react to it and how I react to their reactions. And I hope you'll do that. And I'm enormously grateful to the editor of this journal, David Backhurst, for giving me the opportunity to write this piece and to talk to you. Thank you very much.